Hello, everybody. It's great to see people. Hey. Well, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader with Valley Vision. I know folks are so grabbing food and there's water and there's sodas and other stuff, um, but just wanted to get us started because we have some limited time together and we have a really, really interesting topic to talk about. So, um, welcome to the second in person Twitter Air Partnership event we've done since December 2019. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Twitter Air Partnership or you haven't been to one of our luncheons before, um, really, what, what CAP is actually formed in 1986, so we're 36 years old as a coalition, and it's a group of air quality regulators, business representatives, and public health nonprofits that get together and advocate for clean air policy um, and educate our community about air quality topics uh, pertinent to the Sacramento region, the six county Sacramento region. Um, Valley Vision is a project manager, but it was founded by the Sacramento Metro Chamber of Reef back in about 1986. Um, so I, I want to thank our event sponsors first before going into all the, the meeting logistics. So a big thank you to the Sac Metro Air Districts, Tiger, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sac Association of Realtors, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District, uh, El Dorado Air Quality Management District, <laughs> North State BIA, PGD, Semex, and the Healthy Air Alliance. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, and a little bit of housekeeping before we really get started. Um, so the restrooms for this look, first of all, this location is amazing. So let's do a round of applause for the tech staying. <laughs> View just like stunning view. I've actually never had the chance to come out here. Um, not going to go to Sac State or spending out time in this area, but I just love this place. Um, so, so restrooms are down these stairs immediately at the bottom of those stairs. So they're a really quick walk up outside. Um, water, we have water stations right here. Um, and then there's actually like a water bottle refill also down around the restrooms. Right? Um, trash, we have two trash bins here, and then we're cycling out on this deck. Uh, and then walkways. So just be mindful, mindful of walkways. I know people probably want to get up and get pizza, go to the restroom, get water. So just if you're in a boat, <laughs> just be, be aware. Okay. Um, and so that now, actually, right now, I'm going to do a quick roadmap for our events, and then we'll do a round the room interest because it's, I know a lot of us were catching up with each other, but it's really good. <laughs> To know who's in the room, because we have some really awesome people in the room with relevance to this particular topic that we're talking about today, of course, is the transition of the heavy duty and medium duty clubs. Um, so we'll hear from Paul Arneha. You want to raise your hand, Paul? Uh, he's an air resource at Air Park, who's been working on some new regulations with regard to this topic. Uh, we'll hear then via Zoom. Hey, Jen. Thank you. We can grab some pizza and then. Let's um, then we'll hear from David Renschberg, who's actually joining us uh, via uh, via the internet. And we actually have this uh, OWL uh, device that we're using to connect with him. And you'll see some really cool hybrid meeting uh, stuff in action. Um, and he is the Fleet Division Manager for the City of Fairfield. And he's also the Chair of NEMA NorCal. NEMA stands for the Municipal Equipment Managers Association. So he has a really interesting perspective on this position. And then last but not least, we have Eric, Eric Cahill, um, who's a senior strategic planner of SMUD. He's going to be talking about some of the great work SMUD is doing in its service area to map some of the grid needs with regard to this transition. It's really, really cool. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to intros. Um, so basically, I, I think this room, we're not going to do a mic situation because we're all eating pizza. I think this room is small enough to where we can, we can hear one another. So I'm actually going to start with Eric. Just want to share your name and your affiliation, and we'll go down and try to do this. Let's see. We already introduced me, Eric Cahill, Senior Strategic Business Planner at SMUD. Hi, Paul and Aja, Air Resources Engineer of the Air Force Academy. We're making the park. Hi, everybody. Evan Schmidt, CEO of Alvision. Um, hi, I'm Kristen Kortik. I'm with the Nikola Construction Corporation. And what does Nikola do? Nikola is short group. Yes, constructor and long haul. Heavy duty trucks, so 
Uh, Ted Link Overstar, Transportation Policy Consultant with the California State um, Center for Health Research. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Sal Sane, Health Education Council. I'm with the program coordinator. I'm Dave Johnston, El Dorado Air Quality Center. All good. All good. Air quality is up <laughs> I'm Paul Hensley with the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management Center. I'm Jane Wondell, chair of the Uniform Technical Commission, member of the Commission, member of the Mike Ishiro, I retired. I knew it was still good. And he hears. Hi, Grace Coughlin, Director of Marketing. Hi, Director of Research. Welcome to the Center for the Year. Thank you for coming. All right, we'll go to Pat Chair John Lane next. <laughs> John Lane, environmental manager of Township. As you can imagine, we have quite a, quite a fleet of both medium and heavy duty trucks, and this is a very important year. And, and how did you get here today? Um, well, riding a bicycle would have been easy, but paddling, since I live in Old Folsom, I paddle door to door here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give that. Zero emissions. <laughs> Yeah. Jim Taylor, Sacramento, I'm Sam Sheldon, senior analyst with the Sacramento area council of governors. Uh, I'm Brandon Rose. I am the smart board president. And then in my day job, I'm an air pollution specialist. Rachel Long, director of the Sacramento Uh Darren Ferguson, senior air quality climate change officer analyst at Jim Taylor. Jim Jim Alves, Economic Development for SMUD. Orville Thomas, State Policy Director for CASA. Bill McGavern, Policy Director, Coalition for Clean Air. Richard Paul Cohen, Organizer for United Latinos. Tim Abbott, Senior, Senior Vice President, Strategic Initiatives for the Staff Association. Ian Dwyer, International Strategies. Becky Wood, retired. Well, Becky. <laughs> 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 Long history of the Air Partnership. Do you mind just giving us a little tips? Uh, past chair of the partnership and the, the CAP CAP. Uh, CAP to CAP has always been for too many years. Thanks for coming on Make Armstrong type of material. Ralph Proper and uh, we say it was 86 when it was just started. No, when we, uh, yeah, so yeah, I was with the uh, with this group for the uh, Clean Fuels Task Force thing. And now I'm from the Environmental Council of Sacramento and uh, the Board of Chief California. Uh, Tom Jensen, I uh, work for CEMEX on the uh, Fleet Manager. Thanks for coming. And last but not least, we are partnership staff. Hi, everyone. Kathy C. Chu, Project Associate from Valley Vision. Kathy keeps all the trains running, or in this case, big brakes, or heavy duty vehicles. So Kathy is essential. Thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you, Kathy. So with that, uh, I'm going to transition actually to a uh, PowerPoint presentation that our very first speaker, Paul, is going to be providing. So Paul, you can, you know, from anywhere you'd like in the room, give us a, give us some, some kind of a 101 on what this trans, what's happening with the transition in the, the heavy duty sector uh, and maybe what the state of California is doing. Oh, yeah. Paul, I think a good spot is like right there, so you can still see the slides that we could, yeah, right there. Thanks, everyone. And when you, uh, is this the first slide? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Apologies. And, and just say next slide with human powered equipment. So, thanks, everyone. For I'm Steve, so my name is Paul Asia. I work with the Air Resources Board on our Manhattan Beach Regulation. Uh, so I won't go over the background, but California does have air quality challenges and climate change goals. And this, the rule we're working on is main policy solution those. So I'm talking about Manhattan Beach specifically, this is a rule that's going to be in development that we're hoping to finalize next year. That's four main components that are highlighted here 100% sales requirement on manufacturers in 2040, a requirement 
complete requirements and very strong statement of the government base what we're calling high priority for covering that. Mm -hmm. So this is start with the one manufacturing component. We are looking at several requirements like again 2040, all of the medium and heavy duty vehicles sold in California to the government vehicles. We see this being a critical component to meeting the state's 2045 carbon neutrality goal. And sending wide range market signals to help parts of five days, range transfers, fleets, infrastructure providers, everyone who's the same. Next slide. So, this is the first of the three different fleet requirements on grayish trucks. A grayish truck is any factor trailer that enters the state seaport for rail yards. So, this is structured as uh, a registration requirement for beginning January 1st, 2024. All newly added grayish trucks. Would need to be zero emission. At the same time, the existing grade truck fleet would be retired at the end of their useful life. So, we're going to take 800,000 miles in 18 years. And by 2035, all the grade trucks need to be zero emission. So, this requirement was included in all new emissions or zero emission, and the existing combustion power fleet faces out the time. So, next, I'll go to state and local government fleets. So this applies to any um, public fleet, um, so cities, counties, the state fleet, public utilities, special districts. This is structured as a purchase requirement where a portion of the purchase is due to be zero emission, starting at 50% in 2024, running into 100% in 2027. For the low population density the counties uh, highlighted in red on the map, they will see a, a three-year exemption and requirement to get in 2027. Slide. Next is the high priority and federal fee requirement, the fourth component. This is meant to capture many of the commercial or um, private businesses that are relatively the rest of the nation. In terms of the scope, this affects any fleet with 50 or more vehicles, including those under common ownership control. Any fleet with more than 50 vehicles, any fleet with two of vehicles has more than 50 million annual revenue. So, a large business, you may have a couple business vehicles. So that's otherwise well capitalized to be included. <laughs> this is part of the federal government vehicle law. So I mark some additional requirements to make sure that brokers or motor carriers are compliant fleets. So again, this is covering all of the medium and heavy duty vehicles, off of yard traffic, and some of the light duty vehicles. So, so for this high priority fleet requirement, there's two um, pathways that you can choose to uh, opt into. The default pathway is a model year schedule, which is fairly similar to what we have for grayish trucks. Starting January 1st, 2024, all of the additions to the fleet will need to be zero emission. For the existing combustion powered vehicles in the fleet, they would need to be to continue operating for the end of their useful life at this quick work that needs to be complete. So this ensures that over time, as new vehicles with zero emission and the combustion power fleet vehicles are retired, that the fleet's transition to zero emission. Next slide. So the second option available to high priority fleets is the seven milestone phasing. This is a fleet by percentage approach where the fleet would need to ensure that a certain proportion of their vehicles is zero emission. The way this is structured is that more suitable vehicles are early timelines and less suitable vehicles are later timelines. So the first row, which represents the most suitable vehicles, box trucks and buses, vans, will need to have 10% of the fleet be zero emission in 2025, but to get to 100% by 2035. For work trucks, it includes um, some of the more vocational uh, vehicles, pickups, refuse trucks, utility trucks, and so on. Requirements start in 2027, running up to 100% in 2039. And for the most difficult categories, super cab tractors and specialty vehicles, the first requirements are 2030, running up to fully zero emission 2042. So this option has more flexibility and maybe in fact, we can have vehicles to offer some supply. Next slide. So we have a number of exemptions built into the different components of the fleet rules that are meant to capture situations where. Vehicles aren't available or what's available that meet the fleet's needs. So I'll go over a couple of these. We will be making probably maintaining the list of what vehicles are and are not available, and we'll be keeping that on our website. If you need to purchase a vehicle, and for listings not available, just by one of our vehicles. If the vehicle or infrastructure are delayed outside of control, uh, we will find that there's a delay. And there are a couple of other things, but probably we're trying to make sure that if there are situations outside of the fleet's control that the 
will still be able to turn off the operations. Right. We are expecting significant increase in the in California. And significant benefits, but the health savings from avoiding people from mortalities and reduced air pollution, cost benefits as we reduce sounds, um, zero emission being for attractive and particularly disparate communities where reduced rate has acute health benefits. So, in terms of next steps, we went to the board in late October and we are planning to have a second hearing next year to find your adoption. Over the next couple of months, we'll be having a series of work groups. On December 12th, we have one focus on weight food, such as devices and health care to degree, infrastructure and job unavailability, and a capital workshop with all the changes. We plan to release changes early next year to uh, practice on the board election and to make modifications requested. And final vote in spring 2023 for adoption. So if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to me or get to the uh, monitor either. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, appreciate it. So, so as, as you heard from Paul, there's a lot of forthcoming forthcoming regulation and rules regarding this this sector. Um, and understand that you know CARP had a, a recent hearing. There was I think over 150 commenters all from across various spectrums, and you guys are going to revisit that rule in spring or in the... We're going to be making some, putting out some proposals. Well, first we'll have some work to discuss what the changes. We're going to be officially releasing modified regulations. All that big big changes sometime early next year. We plan to come back to the board in spring of 2023 for a final um, hearing that the board will vote we'll yes or no on. Great. Well, so our next our next speaker is David Rentschler, uh, who's joining us on the Owl. So this is going to be a lot of fun because we're going to um, see David in a in momentarily. There he is. Um, I would just do stop sharing, and then uh, maybe pin David. And then uh, David, I think you maybe introduce yourself and kind of what you do with regard to this conversation and. Um, and so share some of your perspective. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those that haven't seen me speak or, or don't know me, my name is David Rentschler. I do run the, the fleet here at the city of Fairfield where uh, everything from sedans to construction equipment to uh, transit buses to police and fire and everything in between. So a little over uh, 700 units here. So we're kind of a small fleet. Um, uh, <laughs> I am the uh, Government Fleet Magazine's uh, 2022 Public Sector Fleet Manager of the Year. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of these type of uh, events and, and doing a lot of speaking. I also know the CARB staff very well as I've been involved with uh, quite a few work groups and, and so forth over the last uh, probably 15 years. Uh, so Paul gave you a little bit of... of what's going on with the advanced clean fleet regulation. Uh, my perspective is a little different as, as a government fleet and how we are trying to uh, be ready to uh, implement and be successful in uh, being able to meet the, the guidelines of the regulation. So uh, a few things I wanted to talk about uh, since I just have a few a few minutes here. I'm going to share my screen and show you a map of our facility here. So hopefully everybody can see this. It's a little small. If you could just zoom in a little bit. All right. Uh, thank you. Any better? Uh, keep going. There we go. There we go. How about here? Maybe one more. One more. All right. Good measure. Or is it just me? I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> See if that did any. Yeah. Any better for you? That's good. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So. <clears throat> 
Uh, we have parking spots. Uh, we'll start start by kind of okay. Let's so uh, yeah, so uh, one thing I want to mention is uh, you know currently parking spaces have a six inch white painted stripe in between them. Uh, you can drive over it. Uh, it doesn't take much room. Um, as we start putting in the heavy duty uh, chargers, we'll be putting charging infrastructure, so charge boxes and then dispensers in between the parking spaces. So now you need a three foot uh, raised concrete with uh, con uh, metal concrete filled bollards. Uh, so those go in those areas. You'll see some of the parking spaces don't have just a little black line. Now there's a wide strip there. Uh, so you lose parking spaces, and when you're when you have a set area, uh, and you aren't going to reduce your vehicle size or vehicle numbers, now you're losing parking spaces. Uh, so you that's a challenge. So you have to reconfigure things. Um, I'm going to show this area right here. If you can see that green box, those were parking spaces. Now that's where the transformers are going to go um for this facility because we're going to be bringing in three megawatts of power in phase one uh that's quite a few transformers a lot of switch gear uh that has to go in that spot so there we lost 10 parking spaces for 45 foot buses right off the bat um now because we have to to <laughs> uh change our yard around uh we're also going to have to in this area down here we're adding four oversized bays because electric buses require mm -hmm. uh, 10 feet of space around the bus. Um, so we have to extend the building and build new uh, bus bays there. Then we have to move our bus wash and we'll have to put that over here. Uh, so lots of these buildings here in the green have to be taken out and uh, relocated to another area so that uh, traffic can flow through here. So the point I'm trying to get as this project has an ROM of $60 million. Uh, and that is without uh, full build out of chargers, but that's what we're gonna need to do to uh, uh, make this yard usable and be able to maintain and, and store and charge uh, our vehicles. And this is only one of our sites. So <clears throat> I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, we had no money for this. Um, we applied and we were able to get a $12 million federal grant through the FTA uh, because of our transit buses. However, we don't know how we're going to pay for the rest. So I'm not sure if the electeds are going to have to, they'll have to come up with the money somewhere because the city doesn't have that kind of money. Um, and so, you know, these are real things. And uh, <laughs> This goes into effect uh, potentially January 1st of 2024, where we have to start phasing things in. Uh, so we're in the first stage, we call it phase 1A, uh, meeting with uh, PG&E. Um, we're almost done with that now. We're getting ready to go into design phase. Uh, <clears throat> so we're gonna be putting in um, 18 uh, 75 kilowatt uh, charging ports for buses, along with uh, one uh, 124 kilowatt uh, DC fast charger dual port and four 19.2 chargers with two ports each. Uh, that's just to get us started uh, because we do have battery electric buses on order right now. And we already have uh, both on and off road uh, medium duty uh, battery electric vehicles right now. So, <clears throat> Where do we come up with the other $48 million? I'm not sure. I hope our elected officials can uh, uh, <laughs> can find a way to uh, get that money. Um, let's talk a little bit about cost of vehicles. So uh, we have uh, just ordered, like I said, um, we have three on order now. We're getting ready to buy five more uh, battery electric buses, uh, 35 foot buses. They're $1.1 million a piece. Our current uh, same buses are, uh, and if we bought those in diesel, they would be 600,000. 
Now, keeping in mind, nobody likes diesel, but in 2017, we went to renewable diesel. So everything in our fleet, whether it's on-road, off-road, transit, doesn't matter. It's all running on renewable diesel with an 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction. So the construction time on phase 1A, which is the nine uh, chargers with two ports each, so that's the 18 ports, uh, 41 months. And that's not including the 70 week delay that PG&E told us there is on the switch gear. Uh, so uh, we're not sure how we're gonna charge the vehicles we're, that are on order right now that we're gonna get in a year. Um, some, we'll have to come up with some way to charge them because the infrastructures just in the first phase is, is gonna take four years. Uh, and as we start buying vehicles to meet the ACF regulation, we're not going to have a place to charge them. So these are challenges that we're going to, not just the city of Fairfield, every city and county in the state are going to have to face. And folks that haven't been uh, planning uh, like we have, we're three years into our project right now because you have to figure out what type of vehicles you have, how much you use them what type of vehicles you can purchase in zero emission and what's wow. going to be available out there. So uh, this is a, really a big project. And then the last I want to talk about, because it's a really big deal here in, in, uh, in our industry is mechanics and workforce development. Um, we have a shortage of mechanics now and uh, for example, the battery electric buses, the minimum training we have for each technician that they're going to have to go through is 124 hours uh, per technician. So that's a lot of training um, and a lot of time out of the shop. And a lot of mechanics are not going to want to learn anything about these. I remember uh, as a young mechanic back in 1990, uh, the first fuel injected vehicles, electronic fuel injection, uh, OBD-1, uh, were coming off a of warranty. And I remember a lot of, uh, I, I was a new, me new mechanic, so, uh, but yes, a lot of them wanted to uh, not have anything to do with it. They wanted to uh, say, hey, I'm only working on carburetors. I don't want anything to do with those computers. Uh, <laughs> And uh, young guys like me at the time, uh, I was really interested in it and said, yeah, I'll learn it. But it was about a 50-50 split, and we had a lot of folks start to retire at that time. We're already short on mechanics, so I'm not sure what that's going to do to our uh, technician workforce. Uh, however, I can tell you that the technicians we have, we have 14 here. Uh, they're not too happy about uh, having to learn uh, 800 volts AC, which is more than usual uh, industrial electricians deal with on buildings. So that's my perspective on the challenges of us trying to meet the regulation. I well, really appreciate that insight, David. You know, um, different than, than our other speakers and really, really valuable and, and you know, trying to understand from a fleet manager perspective what you have to deal with during this transition. And if I can add one more thing real quick, we recently purchased a select track battery electric tractor. Uh, it's a 25 horsepower uh, off-road tractor with a, a front end loader. It's a great piece of machinery. Uh, however, it's, it's kind of equivalent to a Kubota diesel front end loader uh, you would use around uh, small areas. Um, the diesel, to purchase a diesel one this year would have cost us 16,000. Uh, the select track was 38,000. However, CORE has a great program that uh, gave us a rebate of, uh, we're in a disadvantaged community, so it gave us a $17,000 rebate. Uh, so we got that tractor for only $2,000 more than a diesel one would have been, which is a great deal. So look into those programs. Good tip, pro tip, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so with that, we'll shift to our, our third and final speaker, and then we'll, you know, we want to open it up and have a conversation about all the things that are being brought up today. Um, 
Eric, your slides should be up and you can uh, take it away. Great, you can go on to the next slide. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, I'm going to give you just a taste of, uh, of the major project that I've, done, that I've been spearheading over the past year, which uh, was an energy commission event. We won a small amount of money, as you can see in this project overview there, it won about $200,000. Uh, you know, we're bringing in a good chunk of off match with some of you trying this. And uh, we were partnered with several others uh, you know, in the region as well. The duration is 18 months, running from October 1 of last year. It wraps up uh, at the end of March, but really, we are submitting the final blueprint in a week and the final report in two weeks. And really what the intent of this grant was about was essentially answer the question, what kind of infrastructure? And that's a broad term. It's not just charging infrastructure, but also, um, it's a, as Felipe mentioned, it's also workforce development, you know, skills, uh, labor, skilled labor pipeline as well, um, to support the growing market for zero emission vehicles in Sacramento and uh, the Sacramento County and West Sacramento. So this was originally scoped for just our, our territory. And when this, uh, this opportunity came available, we were approached by AQMD to expand that scope to include zero emission for the fuel cell vehicles and as well as West Side. And the goal here is really you know, four directives we had from the Energy Commission was to Inventory, basically take a census of the medium and heavy duty fleets that we have in the region and identify the home base locations of the, what we anticipate to be some of the most grid impactful fleets in Sacramento County and West Sac. Uh, secondly, to identify optimal siting for depot charging, shared or public medium and the heavy duty charging, as well as high duty stations. Thirdly, to identify technologies that could help mitigate, mitigate grid impacts and lower costs. And fourthly, to identify workforce needs and recommend purchasing systems to develop pipelines as well as labor. Slide, please. So I mentioned we partnered with uh, several agencies. Uh, there's a comprehensive list here uh, that includes eight of us, but uh, I would also like to add that uh, an unnamed partner originally, which was Elk Grove, the city of Elk Grove decided to come in as well, kind of after the fact, and they were a uh, participator in virtually all of the, the monthly meetings and, and sharing, I would say, permit information and permit streamlining. So, realizing this is a lightning talk, I want to get uh, straight to the key findings. Um, but <clears throat> Essentially, what we found, and, and everything to date, it's really spanned like the studies that we've done previously, right up until just last year, was showing every anything from what we showed about 37,000 medium energy trucks, all the way up to seen as high as about 65,000 in terms of some of the forecast. At the end, we basically captured, as you can see, about 24, a little over 24,000 trucks and buses that are domicile here in Sacramento. There are thousands more, of course, that, that transit through trailer trucks and so on that uh, go through Sacramento daily. Those that are domiciled here, are close to 5,000 unique addresses. Uh, we identified about you know, over half, which we basically captured about 134 of the largest grid depots. Um, about half of those actually fall into four clusters. Uh, and I named several of them there. Depot Park, which is the former Sacramento County Depot, uh, North Sac, um, Quillen area, now for Platts downtown. Those are all in our territory. And then uh, West Sac is a four. Those are all in equity communities, which make them a prime candidate for some of the initial um, you know, initial funding that uh, you, you might uh, be able to capture from grant opportunities for federal and state. Um, we estimate SMUD, uh, and I should mention PGE was not a partner in this. And West Sac, of course, lies in, in PGE's territory, so we limited in that capacity. But we estimate that we could meet most of the fleet customer charging needs with existing infrastructure and resources um, through 2030. 
with limited capacity in West Side. Basically, what we did was we, we brought on a, a research, a third party vendor to do the analysis of keeping me on the right to be And we found that there looks like there's going to be some significant constraints. There's a lot of fleets, obviously, in the West Side, it's a big center of gravity. And basically, further studies needed. We as SMUD are not about to go, you know. Um, Says and speaking for PG and E, let's put it that way. So we just basically leave it at that, and we know that Sam over at Safe Hog is about to embark on the kickoff for the mega region for Sacramento and the broader mega region, North Carolina mega region grant, which is following on the heels of our grant, hopefully the third one. We also uh, found that nearly all large uh, truck and bus fleets have a dedicated uh, fleet uh, fuel depot, and they expect to add charging. In the near term, and hydrogen refueling in the longer term. Expensive. Even though we definitely heard with regard to hydrogen dispensing, there's more of a leap, uh, uh, an expectation that that would be they would be leveraging more public sites than they would uh, behind the fence. Uh, many smaller fleets and owner operators rely on public share stations, and about a third of the population of these uh, trucks uh, belong to independent owner operators. Uh, so that is a particular area, while they don't necessarily fall under the requirements of uh, advanced clean fleets, for example, and therefore we expect them to be kind of more on the, the late market laggards to really come in. We nevertheless need to be thinking about how we're going to address those vehicles as well, since they will not have the kind of capital that uh, some of these larger medium sized fleets will. And therefore, those are the ones we expect we like to have first. And then there's no depot fleets, as we call, right? They have no access or to uh, overnight charging. And a lot of these, of course, are individual operators. And one of the uh, things we learned from surveys and interviews with fleets was that they would really desire um, you know, the ability to, to charge, you know, fast charge, while loading and unloading at the facility. So that facility may be owned by some, it's likely owned by somebody else. And of course, those facilities don't want to have to be paying for those fleets. So we have to figure out a way to solve that problem. So we've got that identified. Um, we also, on the workforce front, kind of will need about 1,200 skilled uh, workers to uh, fulfill the medium and heavy duties of needs by 2027. Um, that's amongst about 3,000 uh, if you include light duty. And then interactive job training and a community support system is going to be key for recruitment and retention. Since a lot of the, the training, as I think they've already mentioned, the retention, if there are significant retention issues, because a, a lot of uh, you know the participants simply don't have the financial means to spend these kind of hours of training. In many cases, that might be unpaid training, they have family or other uh, issues to work around. And having a community support system is key to that. I want to go to the next slide. Um, so we've uh, developed some kind of draft recommended actions. We're circulating some of these internally and, of course, amongst our partners and collecting uh, all of that feedback. But the first thing we want to do is we want to support early adopter fleets. SMUD uh, launched a new program, really two new programs that they fall under the e -Fuel, uh, SMUD eFuel monitor. Uh, so we have the SMUD eFuel Advisor Program, which basically provides free advisory services to fleets of all <laughs> of sizes. And that enables those fleets to not only learn about hey, what, what are the, what's the policy, what are my compliance requirements, educate uh, all of that, but also can help fleets determine which vehicles best match their duty cycles uh, from more of a unbiased, uh, you know, kind of broken standpoint and uh, trusted broker standpoint as well as what kind of charging solution. The second, and what we really want to focus on, obviously, we're going to be some of those, uh, those really 42 fleets that we found, uh, large fleets, those are either like, greater than 50 vehicles in their fleet or more than $50 million annually. Uh, there's 42 in, uh, collectively in SAC, and that's that, and those are the ones that are likely to electrify first, so we're already having conversations with some of those, but as others as well. Um, the other is, is there is an opportunity at Depot Park because Depot Park is also where the California Mobility Center happens to be, where we're going to need and to partner with them to do a lot of workforce development. 
There's also um, your fueling stations, I believe the soil is over there, and the ability to add um, hydrogen stations, for example, uh, hydrogen dispensing uh, units, as well as uh, fast charging. They're into experiment. You know, the launch, we're talking about potentially launching a couple of pilots there. One might look uh, at, you know, not just, um, uh, would look at, say, that loading dock charging issue and whether we can create a program that can solve that. Uh, another is the is, is launching like a VTV or transactive energy where we really can participate in energy markets um, through, you know, basically um, in store and then selling electricity. Um, let's see, what else? Increasing access to shared ZEV charging fuel stations is another one. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, again, helping some of these businesses add fueling stations and charging stations. We do that through, of course, the Smart E-Fuel Advisor Program. I didn't mention we also have the E-Fuel Solutions um, offering as well. And the solutions can actually uh, help those that are more capital constrained. Um, basically, the wheel essentially kind of front that capital for them and then charge it back on, on service fee. Uh, so we install, maintain, uh, and even uh, can operate those, um, you know, those charges uh, on behalf. And then um, the, the, another here is implementing West Sacramento plant, the first time medium and heavy duty charging, taking steps to bolster the workforce development pipeline. And uh, finally, I already mentioned uh, the North, Northern California neighborhood and set of blueprints. So that's just a high level taste. There's uh, a number of slides that go into some detail, but I wanted to. Now, that pretty much covers that. Well, thank you so much. It's been a uh, round of applause for And Dick Sam, I know you were you were mentioned as working on that mega regional effort to do, I guess, kind of a larger geographic look. At, uh, do you want to give us any uh, perspective on how that's going? Or is yeah, sure, Adrian. Uh, last year. SIGO applied for half a million dollars to study interregional freight charging and fueling between Bay Area, San Joaquin County uh, Council of Governments, and SACOG. So, a mega regional study to understand uh, where we need the truck refueling charging stations. Uh, we received that grant last summer. We're wrapping up an RFP process uh, this week. So, we're hopeful, hopefully, we can kick off with a slightly Consultant on the contract early next year. Really get that. It's a timely conversation. And I, I just saw, uh, I think early this morning, the first deliveries of the Tesla semi truck were made yesterday evening to Pepsi. So uh, a lot of stuff happening in the space right now. Um, and so I was really hoping we could have a conversation about, about this transition. We have a lot of really smart people in the room who are working on this. We have from all perspectives, the government. From the nonprofit sector, all the kind of the, the tenets of the community partnership. And I'm curious if folks have either questions for our speakers. And I think David did have to have to leave at 1245. So our two remaining speakers or other topics would like to elevate. I have my prepared one, so I always like, you know, to hear from you guys first. So, yeah, so Adrian, I, I, David mentioned. A lot. He didn't talk as much about what he has to do to his actual maintenance building as a result of this. It was part of the $60 million that has to be spent before he can actually put really a charger to service this particular site. There's a lot of work he has to do with the facilities, like we mentioned, the library bay expenses because of the So, you know, that's the one thing that he said, and I don't think it got stressed enough, and I think it's something that everybody here should take back if they possibly can to make sure that elected representatives understand. He did say how much more it's going to cost. 60 million bucks. Well, it's on the side. side. Right, right. He has that. And that's public agencies, and poor folks like these guys got to figure out how to come up with it out of their own pockets. Public agencies are going to need to get it funded, and elected officials are going to need to fund it. And I know because I've worked with County that the county board of supervisors is working in, in, interactively with the fleet, county fleet office. There's a lot of sort of pushback when issues come up about costs associated with this, but elected officials are going to need to know that they.
they have to come up with a lot of uh, damages, probably it's taxes, or probably it's fees for elected officials that change that So they, I just think it's really important for them to be aware of this. They're intending to come with their fees. A lot of fees go with agencies are going to be really that well aware of what's going on. And if a fleet is hardly aware, the public officials who represent that fleet, the city council members, the board of supervisors across the entire state. But for those of us in this room, we, how, how aware are they that they need to come up with money? There won't be enough money coming up are the energy facilities won't be enough money to keep in. So I just want you to please make sure the elected officials are aware of how much is ready to get to the place or else these these changes are not happening. Since Corey now Corey was always a cow star we don't ever talk about Internal combustion engines, length of like, duration and use, and the cost is on organizations and the public. So we always bring this up like, oh, the upfront cost of that electric fuel cell is so much, but we can also monetize the total cost of ownership and see the savings reduction. So I think we all, as advocates or partners, or, you know, Fleet managers have to do a better job of explaining how to do this. And the costs are going down. The Texas route just came out yesterday. It has a range of about 500 miles for their longer, about their extended version, 300 miles for their standard version. And that is going to be a game changer when it comes to class seven and eight and good movement. And then, you know, to Tim's point, there might not be an infinite amount of dollars, but the governor has a $10 billion five year multi year seven funding plan that does provide a huge amount of rate. If there's 20 something million dollars at part right now in their hybrid and zero emission or truck and bus voucher incentive program that is ready for people to say, yeah, we want to make some of these purchases and the state will give you uh, over $100,000 into that gap. So, so yes, it does cost a lot of money up front, but the savings on the uh, lifetime and the savings in terms of maintenance are good. And then we heard our speaker from Fairfoot talk about it. He's gone to a lot of other places where there are the maintenance that are really excited about the transition to zero. It isn't one take of we're dinosaurs now, we don't want to do that. This is, there's a lot of new talent coming into the workforce, a lot of money going into the workforce to develop. We'll go to Bill McGavern next because Coalition Clean Air has a perspective on this too, and there's a lot of advocacy. And just raise your hand if you have something you'd like to. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Just following up on Bill's point, the Air Restrictions Board, when they do a major regulation like this, they actually do a calculation of the cost and the savings. And um, Paul probably has these numbers in his head. I remember that for advanced clean fleets, the, the cost savings far outweigh the actual costs. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's important. We look at it. I know the board members look at it when they're discussing the regulation. Paul, do you have those numbers? Yeah, with advanced clean fleets, when we have to the regulatory compliance in 2015, we are estimating that savings of 22 billion. We're not sure when we hire on the company. Here is all the vehicles here. All the vehicles are really quite saving. We say it's eight liters, it's cost of two liters to buy. So the state has a number of programs that can help out. Um, there are funding programs to help all the state has a carbon fuel standard program that lowers the cost of low energy fuel like electricity and hydrogen. So there are programs that basically lower the cost. So we do expect to see a savings. So we work on it also, but there is a fund that the cost of the did you guys estimate though for like that seemed pretty substantial for one facility, sixty million dollars? Like, I I can't imagine that that is what people are, are expecting to pay who haven't been doing three years of research, uh, such as Fairfield. I think what we kind of recognize is that each facility is different in terms of the upgrades that need to be made. I mean, but sometimes we have a lot more. Um, 
expensive stuff on the left, and I think like we might go make those trying to figure out why it's going to be expensive. We can take a look at our own. We'll probably be leaving funding over the past couple of years to see what the cost has been and the relative average based on that. Not about that quality, but we will go to the site specific quality costs. Yeah, I just wanted to give another perspective because I definitely appreciate the perspective of the long term costs and our, and, and as you mentioned, our mechanics are certainly look forward to the, the, the less amount of maintenance and the overall use of the vehicles. But the upfront cost is not insubstantial for business. I mean, the reality is you have to back and gain access to that capital that a long term will pay off. But this is across the state of California for small, medium, and larger fleets. So that is not. Did substantial issue. What caught my eye or caught my ear really was the timelines, which certainly the cost is one thing, but another is like the infrastructure right. costs of the timelines that, that the city of Fairfield was mentioning, which is pretty significant. In that, you know, they've been working on it for three years, and, and there are some that haven't even started yet. So that is going to be a challenge. And, and then the question I had either from you, Eric, was, was always kind of bounced around in our mind is that. The projection was is that there's enough SMUD has enough power to support the demands of this, but there's also the off road, and then there's all the other um, push for electricity, which is really changing the structure of demand. It, when you say there's enough power, is that capture everything, or is that just really? I so, was focused on medium and heavy duty. Yes. Yeah. So we're working on adding additional layers. Right. Off the Right. What this did was really take off kind of the first pass, which initially for us was kind of the worst case. Right. Yeah. No magnets driving in, we plug in immediately during our system peak. So that's how we kind of stress right. tested this medium and heavy to determine you know, what, are, what are our limits here, even though they're virtually zero electrical charges. But when we factor in, much more likely scenario to involve the kind of size of it gets it gets a lot more within it. Doesn't mean that we're we're not gonna have a work cut out for us to do and we're already uh you know knee deep and, and working internally to do that. But you know it, at least what this tells us is that we can support it and we now have an idea of where to focus in the near term implementation. Help us kind of phase into this in a strategic way and we'll try to manage the cost for that reflection for that. Two more hold on a minute. I don't mean that I it would be my second time. So why don't you oh, I might just really quick in the one thing that I always see with these discussions that slightly concern me is that in this map it also shows cost mile power. And one of the challenges is the vast majority of the year the power grid goes down in a lot of this area. We have good vehicles up there that need to operate. We have this community very heavily along this path. Um, and that infrastructure is not there. And the timeline that you have proposed, I have, I just, there's a general concern is with looking at counties and places that are above the zone line, you're going to have a whole other set of issues. Like you're making blanket statements based on urban areas and not taking into account the vast majority of these counties also do very Um, I learned about the profession when I was here, so I won't speak again. Uh, first, I, I hear what you said about how they will be the number one discussion, how we do that. Uh, it's also not related to the official um, line. So, for those of you who have access to the electric official, I want to share quickly uh, something that could be a resource. So, I come to different different location on top of the energy fund. Um, so very briefly, um, the non-profit is about you know local residents and all managed to convince corporations making a billion or more in revenue to give a minimum about one percent um, of the revenue to fund uh, clean energy so that you know businesses that really need to electricity and very big and responsible. I'm just saying that maybe this is something um, that Actively explore and if you would like access to that presentation, I'm not sure it's still there and we can continue. And then the last very two quick questions. One is I was very interested um, in the first presentation that you mentioned of the uh, public workshops. 
Um, and I'm mentioning that because I know CFO uh, work over the world and institutions who are also maybe not happy about people to be called to get the time. But I was wondering time permit and if you have to do that, if you should go with that as your point of target for that time that should be outreach and if um, people are even going to be for the time. And I'm asking that because sometimes the teaching of the people from the when the last thing for justice in general question, I'm sure it's integrated in our coalition, but I think quite clear thinking long term strategy. I'm guessing that there will be exploration of partnerships with vocational schools and the constituent the next generation of non professional skilled workers. Just a kind of thank you all. And the presentations were really, really well. Yeah, would you guys like to respond? <laughs> We want to work out how to do this stuff. So, for all our leadership processes, we have a bunch of workshops that we have. We're getting the we're sharing what we're trying to achieve with our regulations, develop a rule that can probably solve the most important reality and gain feedback on the stakeholders. In terms of, um, so during the rulemaking process, we had one more workshop to try to gain more people's personal perspective. These are focused on some kind of narrow areas of the world that we can feedback on. So, um, waste hollow fleets, that are available in infrastructure. So, those are the three we're planning. They're all open to the public in a hybrid format we're planning. So, I'm in person and online in the room. Um, so, in terms of any outreach, we are trying to expand our general outreach, which is warning people about what's happening with the world out there for the climate revolution. We want to reach out to the outreach like Right now, but yeah, we want to make sure that communities are aware of what's happening and what the needs are. So we can definitely get a nice set of more outreach events. Let's try to expand those groups and get everyone aware of what's being very close to the line of water. Thank you. Uh, we've got a horrible end. And let's have the end of this question. You know, class are now brought up county will likely fall heavily under the exemptions for either infrastructure or maintenance or model vehicles available. And like a low population for example, county will kind of slow some of that down. But in addition to what is going to happen, you know, the federal government is now giving out money for the United States EV infrastructure plan. California over the next five years is going to almost four hundred million dollars develop a system of use of fast charging, mostly for light duty that should have every 50 miles. Uh, we're really pushing on Caltrans and other are and the Energy Commission to incorporate media and heavy duty funding into that and not just be blind to like that EV in our you know, solution network. So hopefully in years two, three, four, five, we'll have some you know, funding dedicated for the media and heavy duty. Uh, in addition to what we talked about today, Handle Carb is doing generously with you know, grant programs and C, is you know, the Inflation Reduction Act provides a huge amount of money for fleets that are looking to transition. So, commercial fleets that are you know, class one to two B will get $7,500 for each zero emission vehicle that they want to transition over. And that doesn't have the heavy domestic requirements that the uh, personal use light duty does. And then, class three and up will have a cap of $40,000 for every vehicle you want to buy. You know, that doesn't take into account the like, excise tax and the legislation to make that on par with the combustion. But there's a lot of work going on at the federal level to bring that initial cost down. And manufacturers have said they see the parity coming within this decade. So yeah, we have to plan ahead. It's going to be a little bit of a bite up front, but you should see more towards the latter part of the decade. It being more cost beneficial to plan in accordance for the zero. Do you have resources that like break down exactly? Yeah, I, I, I'll say that's your slideshow. I can see, that. I can see, you know, the, the Metro Chamber sharing with its members, you know, so that there's more awareness of how about some of these things. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to, I'm Kristen Porter again with Nicola, so I just wanted to provide you a little bit of the industry side perspective from this. Um, so we are a class eight vehicle manufacturer based in Phoenix, um, and thank you, Adrian, for the invite to this presentation. 
Um, but we are also a vertically integrated company. So we're working on the infrastructure side as well as the vehicle um, production side. Um, a couple of the different things that each of you have touched on, I'll touch on from our different perspective, one of them being the upfront cost. The upfront cost that we see is very, very heavy for smaller fleet operators. Um, and it's and it quite honestly is a is a large upfront cost for larger scale um, fleet operators as well. However, the solution that we found and that we advocate for when we're talking to different fleets is to maximize on a, the different state grant programs, such as what you mentioned, or of the um, HBIT program allowed for the state, which brings down the cost of the vehicle purchasing. This is just for heavy duty class eight trucks. Um, and that does significantly reduce the cost, the upfront cost. It's also a matter of bringing in more and varied um, trucks into the market. So we're actually in competition with Tesla. However, we're excited to hear that Tesla is bringing new trucks onto the market because that's going to create a market driver that's ultimately gonna drive down the cost of purchase. Even though the demand is obviously there, a lot of fleet operators don't know that these products are out there and available because they simply don't know that they're up in operation. One of the most difficult uh, problems that we had during the pandemic was supply chain. It's similar to the issue that everybody has going to just order toilet paper all the way up through production of these like heavier duty or trucks. Um, so supply chain for us at our manufacturing facility was um, not as much of a concern on our bev side it is on the fuel cell electric side and that's also part of the reason why as nicola as an organization chose to go into both industries that's not the same with a lot of the different heavy duty manufacturers across the board uh, one will either typically they'll choose to either go into the battery electric side or the hydrogen side but not necessarily both um, the drawbacks of going into one are, you know, the battery and the energy upfront costs are significant. And the other side of it is that fuel cell and fuel cell infrastructure needs a lot more in order to be developed to get further down the road. Um, the other point that I'll make is we are working really heavily as an industry partner to seek out partnerships with public agencies where we can come in and provide um, the infrastructure and the fleet solutions for both ends and try to get those as quickly developed as possible because industry can work a lot faster than public agencies can. Um, and that is for multiple purposes. Um, some is just by design, others is the process to go all the way from um, project design and concept through permitting and then development and make things fully online and operable is much slower at a public agency than it would be uh, for a private development. Um, so these are just a couple of different perspectives um, and I'm happy to answer any additional ones. I will point out that NICLA just applied for three different hydrogen fueling stations in the Sacramento area. So- um, Where are they? Or can you not tell us? <laughs> no, I, I'm happy to tell you. It's public information now. If, if, if it wasn't public information, I wouldn't be able to. El Bro um, is one of our targeted sites, um, Metro Air Park and McClellan. So those are the three that we've initially targeted. Um, and we're anticipating project development further down the valley and toward the Bay Area as well um, within the 2023 cycle. <laughs> Well, one uh, question I have is related to one of the Fed's channels, but of course we have the Metro Chamber with us and they managed their for over 50 years they've been doing their capital capital advocacy program that the clear air partnership actually staffs uh, the air parties in the public. Um, and so I'm thinking about, you know, we have Roberto with Senator Pia's office. Maybe you know or have some insight into like what the minutes, you know, we, we've talked a lot about state folks. So what do we expect kind of you know, from the federal. Definitely. Hi again. Uh, my name is Roy. I'm the Senator Padilla. And, well, as, as it was mentioned a few minutes ago, there's a lot of funding that is going to be available soon in, in the Venture Inflation Reduction Act uh, that we're looking at as early as 2023. 
And we don't have the details on that. I was actually just taking notes. We've had uh, other agencies in the past do workshops for all the different grants that they're going to have available throughout the year, the deadlines and everything, and how, what are the packages they're going to be needed to apply. So I'm going to talk to my team in DC, see if we can organize one of those for California. I mean, obviously, we want to. I'm, I'm the Northern California Tour rep. I represent Sacramento, so I want to have it in Sacramento. <laughs> but, you know, this should be, you know, this is going to be very helpful for them, actually. Um, Something that I that I like to do is uh, hopefully I can get everyone's everyone's information here. I call them talk to you in your email. So as these grants are you know they, they become available, I can send you all you know, the information for you want to apply. That'd be great. And once you apply to those grants, uh, you can also reach out to our office for um, letters of support. I know we've done them in the past for some of you all. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's a, you know that, that's one of the biggest things that we can do. So I just be there to back you up and provide you information. Uh, a lot of times it is agencies to make the decision of who's going to be getting the funding. Uh, but if we can you know, provide all the information that the support we do want to do that. And I did have a question that I don't think we've, we've talked about, and I wanted to ask Dave to go to that. Um, but it, as far as all this equipment that is going to be required, is there, is there a program to this side? Or, you know, are there already plans and where this is allocated? I'm just you know, curious. And, Maybe this is a silly question, uh, but I, I'm not very much sure. Does anybody know? Yes. <laughs> 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 depending on the grade funding and the specific requirement, you might want to make sure that there's a solution. Sometimes we've seen in the past that 20, 30 year old vehicle that is going to Central America, South America, we have to like finish our national and, and state other ranking level. Uh, so it depends a lot on what the programs are. The federal level, the state level, they will have different scrapping requirements. The school bus industry, you know, farms grants don't require scrappage, but the energy commission grants do. And then if you want to get a federal EPA grant, those are going to require scrappage. So we're trying to figure out if there's opportunity to kind of allow for a use of that same equipment to get the grant to transition, but still have that vehicle in the fleet. So if you're in a more rural area, then it would be utilized in the right condition. So there's still heavy conversation. So well, after that, the uh, one of the items we found was some of these smaller fleets. Uh, you know, they they purchase used vehicles, right? They're not purchasing like new trucks. They're purchasing used in the second in the secondary market. I don't, you know, we don't yet know how to solve that problem because that's where some of these larger fleets are going to be offloading their, their vehicles. Um, so, how are we going to address that issue? I can add that some of the tools they came up are of an agency has to make a future effort uh, for the zero budget competitor, which will aim to figure out what to do with the rest of these heavy duty vehicles that aren't. Identity, so on the smaller side, looking at different strategies to achieve this as there are different ways to do this, uh, potentially registration fees, green zones, direct work rules, just different ways other than just straight regulation that would allow for potentially lower cost and more flexible. So that's the broader strategy we're going to be working on after the next few weeks. Well, we have time for maybe one more from someone who hasn't spoken yet. Actually, we'll do two because we have <laughs> We'll get to it. We do Richard first, and then our honorary staff. Steve. Thank you, Richard. Richard Paul told me that it has been an interesting discussion, a lot of um, interesting information that um, I hope you get some of the slide decks to take the information back, at least for the community that I think that the panel's work for specifically. But to the point, I want to stress, let's not forget that workforce development piece of it. Right, Latinos and a few other um, partners within the Latino community here in the Sacramento region have already reached out about the art opportunities for workforce development. And there are so many barriers to that that we need to overcome. And I would recommend to any of you right now this is a great discussion. We've got a part of we've got to talk about this. But that next generation coming up, I can tell you within the community that I work with, many do not feel like they belong to this technology. But there are opportunities. We have to make sure we are being intentional in our outreach, in our development, and in the way that we bring forward possibilities 
not just for this type of workforce development of green tech in general, but put that out and we welcome an opportunity to talk to any of you in the future about this and some of the plans that we have been trying to put forward, but have been stalled by a lot of other pieces of things that are going on. In the California Mobility Center that we worked with in the parking lot on the project, we submitted a report probably a month or two ago that really lays out a lot of the detailed findings um, and then spotlights and highlights some of the issues and barriers that we mentioned as well as a framework for um, having a template that yeah. might be adopted. I, I, have, I have seen it. I'm really excited about what's going on, but it's interesting again. How many of you don't know about our building sectors? So we got to get those words out. We got to figure out grassroots ways to get to the communities and say, hey, this is for you. Make them a part of it because that's what will help make it successful. Let me know how I can help it. Okay. Um, we were speaking about flexibility. I'm, I'm especially concerned about flexibility when it comes to trucks with perishable products. Um, Especially ready mix trucks. Because <laughs> you have a battery go out and now you have. So, any, any thoughts on flexibility for trucks with perishable products? For me. <laughs> or, or, or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flexibility with the trucks, there's a couple of different solutions that we looked at. Um, you know, we support mobile fueling stations. So we when we sell different um, vehicles in our operations and fleets, we also provide mobile fueling stations as a solution for that. Um, and the thought process behind that is the the class eight that we're selling right now in the bev space is intended to be a day use only. It's not intended to be an overnight cab. And with the support of knowing that those trucks can only go 350 miles, which is the full life cycle of the truck. Um, if they can only go within 350 miles and then they have a mobile fueling source that can be provided as part of that sale in a bundled lease. Um, if there is downtime, that would be the solution to be able to go in, regenerate the truck, um, with the hope that in that time period, um, which would be a, a couple of hours, so to speak, to be able to swap out a vehicle if needed, um, that the potential for perishables to be completely gone or products to be completely gone, that solution would be cut down more significantly. It also depends on the type of truck itself. Um, the truck that we sell has a 93% uptime. Um, for the market, which means that downtime is only 7%. So that's a 7% that's a window of a chance for that, those types of vehicles in operation to be broken down for whatever purpose. Um, like CalSART was saying earlier, um, the technology and the breakdown is significantly less in the battery electric than it has been that we've seen in the diesel markets. So um, it really comes down to the type of vehicle that's being purchased um, and the solution that is accompanied with that. On the fuel cell side, it's the same thing. So the fuel cell that we are in the process of gamma testing right now, which will come onto the market um, in 2023, also has an over 90% uptime. We have two different um, operators that we've been working with to pilot both of these programs. One of them is Anheuser-Busch in Southern California. The other one um, was out of the port of Los Angeles, and both of them said that um, so far, and I'm happy to release the study on both of those, um, the downtime and the potential for downtime for both of those um, was significantly decreased as opposed to the diesel function of the larger heavy duty trucks or things like that. So we're almost out of time, but I know several of us are working on really cool stuff, and I wanted to give some opportunities for a few folks to kind of share some upcoming things. Um, starting with, please um, share. So this cap to cap thing came up in this meeting. Uh, what is it, and how can folks get involved with the good thing? Yeah, it's not very good effort. Just wondering for I'm aware. 
<laughs> big enough to stand up for. Um, Captain Cap is the Metro Chamber's largest and longest standing program. Uh, it is our advocacy program in Washington, D.C. We had a meeting or kickoff meeting for our steering committee group this morning, and the program dates are April 22nd and 26th. Worthwhile, there are almost 400 local, regional leaders that attend, elected officials, and thought leaders from this region. And we go specifically to lobbying and advocate for good things that we bring back to the, uh, the Sacramento region. So uh, this was a big part of it, which is a good opportunity. Like all of these great questions that I'm hearing in the room, it's a great opportunity to get those together um, and have them included in one of our policy papers. We have 12 policy teams. Um, those were the leaders that met this morning. So we had about 45 people on a Zoom call using our OWL. Great technology. Shim was plugged, not at all affiliated with, just really like it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely worthwhile. And these are exactly the kinds of things, the kinds of discussions that lead to the thoughtful changes to uh, to topics just like this. Yeah, so the theater partnership staff, the air quality team, there's also the workforce team, there's all sorts of other really impactful teams that go to this program. We'll be sharing information about how you can get involved. Uh, it does have a cost, but it's well worth it. For our reason. We have one if I just kind of a Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of Sacramento Queen Cities and sponsored the that project. We'll be sponsoring a few positions. We'll be going back and specifically related to organized tension on the energy and specifically related to that piece. That is definitely about transportation. That's going to be a good Second, you have the ability to sponsor that. That doesn't mean you get paid for the travel, but that's sponsored. I just want to mention it's similar to what you're talking about, but it's only one of the team. Get alignment. Um, well, Kevin Schmidt, uh, my boss at Valley Vision, would you like to share anything about uh, this new Community Economic Resilience Fund or SERP? efforts that is going to be, that has kicked on, but it's going to be really, I think, ramping up soon. Yeah, sure, thanks, Adrian. Um, so, you know, back this summer, Valley Vision applied to be the regional convener for our eight-county region for this program, the Community Economic Resilience Fund. Uh, the purpose of this program is to create a regional vision for inclusive economic recovery and growth. And, um, <laughs> There's a lot of excitement about it. <laughs> anyway, we learned uh, at the end of October that, that we had received the grant. It's a $5 million planning grant for our region. In this instance, the region is defined as an eight county region. It includes Sacramento, Yolo, Yuba, Sutter, Colorado, Placer, Nevada, and Calusa counties. Um, we haven't kicked off the program yet. We're still in, kind of getting into the contract with the state, but we are hoping to kick off. January 1st. I know many people in this room have heard about it, some of letters of support for us. Uh, we're looking forward to bringing the coalition together and really thinking about how do we build this collective vision. Two really important things about it. First of all, it is really focused on a transition to a low carbon economy. So what we're talking about right here, um, including the infrastructure and the workforce component is very relevant to that program. And this is gonna be a great opportunity to, to create that vision. Um, and it's also very equity centered. So it's really looking at communities that have historically been dis disinvested in our region and making sure that solutions are really centered around those communities. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is there are resources connected to this program. And so there's $550 million in the state budget to implement the priorities. In the so within the next, probably starting six, in six months or less, they're going to start releasing parts of those implementation funds um, to help support this. So we're really excited. It's going to be a major program with Valley Vision. We hope we can work you all. Stay tuned. And know we're right at 1.30, but one more special person who has a really fun announcement that I think all of us can plug into pretty easily. Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, Dave Hoffman again of Valley Vision. 
Um, just wanted to invite you all to join us um, in a couple of weeks at our hydrogen locomotive webinar. Um, this is to replace a um, diesel switcher locomotive um, at the Port of West Sacramento. So it's going to be the first of its kind in the world that will be um, completely on hydrogen. So hope you all can join us. So there's a QR code here. I can also send you the link. Um, Hit the QR code. I'll send it in a follow-up email. So I'll definitely check it out. Webinar. With that, you guys, thank you all for joining us today at this beautiful uh, Aquatic Center um, and participating in the discussion today. I know we should go a lot deeper, and I think there are opportunities to do that, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one with some of the folks that we've met today. Uh, we'll continue to share out all the information and resources that we talked about today. I uh, just want to give a big shout out to Kathy Seichu, our fair partnership staff. So we'll that thank you. Course, we'll, we'll have a recording. We'll, we'll see. The recording was through the hour, so it might be interesting. We'll all have a chance to check it out. Uh, we'll send that in the follow up information. Thank you all again. And stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grab some pizza if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Get some pizza. <laughs> yeah.